I'm so glad that you have arrived early because that means that you can see the compost experiment before we start the lecture. So as part of my research on storing more carbon in soils, I'm also working on urban food waste. Now, this is just a prototype of a bigger experiment that we're doing. Come and have a look at the setup that we've got in our garden. What we're doing with our research is measuring some of the important parameters like temperature. You can see we've got a temperature logger here and then we've got more temperature loggers both inside the bin and inside the compost itself and as well as weighing the compost that goes in and eventually comes out at the end of the experiment, we're also taking samples to measure the pH, the carbon and nitrogen content and all of the parameters that affect the turnover of organic matter. Now that we've put the compost out, let's get into the lecture itself and look at this climate solution, which is right here underneath our feet, soil carbon. Many of you will have seen different representations of the carbon cycle. And I think it's really good to look at it again from different perspectives if you've seen it before or to hone in and maybe on some parts of the carbon cycle that you're not so familiar with if you have seen it often before. I tend to look and focus my research and the research of my group on the atmosphere, plant, soil side of things. I don't work in the oceans, but it's important to acknowledge that the, the atmos atmosphere-ocean interface is an important part of the carbon cycle. So when I see this diagram, I always immediately, as a soil scientist, hone in on the soil carbon part. You can see a big white arrow going from a tree down into the ground. And all of the white numbers in this representation of the global carbon cycle are stocks or pools of carbon. So you can see 2,300 gigatons of carbon is stored in the soil. Now that might not be the first pool or process that you look at depending on your interest. And when we talk about storing carbon, people often think about growing more trees, about the possibility of protecting our old growth forests or planting trees to store carbon above the ground in the terrestrial biomass. And that is definitely an important part of our response to climate change for both the carbon benefits and also other biodiversity benefits. But if you look closely, and I'm sure many of you have quite a small screen tonight, but look right in to around the tree and the plant area, and you'll see that there's 550 gigatons of carbon stored in that above ground biomass. That's all across the planet. The yellow numbers are the fluxes that are occurring of carbon moving from one pool to the other. We've got 800 gigatons of carbon up into the atmosphere and we're constantly taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it back in, not only through our burning of fossil fuels, which is that human emissions in red text and that red number nine gigatons of carbon per year, but also natural processes are taking carbon out of the atmosphere and adding carbon back into the atmosphere. So we're going to focus in specifically now on the role of plants in the carbon cycle. So I'm a soil scientist and I always say I don't know what's going on in plants, but I'm incredibly grateful to plants and plants really are our allies in the fight against climate change because they are continuously taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it together inside their bodies with sunlight and water and nutrients that they've got from the soil to create solid stored carbon, the body of plants. They're able to do this in all different climates all around the world. And it's this incredible process of photosynthesis that creates almost all of the food that we eat. The clothes that I'm wearing today are plant-derived and much of my house and probably many of your houses as well have also come from this fantastic 
ability that plants have to remove carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn it into a solid form in their bodies. We represent this process in this very simplified chemical equation. So carbon dioxide from the atmosphere plus water, which plants get from their roots, which they get out of the soil, plus energy from the sun, reacts inside their bodies to form solid carbon, this CH2O, a simple glucose molecule, plus oxygen. But you'll notice that the arrow in this chemical equation goes in both directions. So plants are continuously photosynthesizing, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turning it into this solid carbon. And then there's four possible fates for this solid carbon, which largely end up in it going back into a gaseous form. So one, the plant can be burnt. Fire sends this equation back in the other direction. People and other animals can eat the plant. Again, we take the energy that we need from this solid carbon and we breathe out CO2. The plants also break down these structures within their own bodies to get more energy internally and grow other structures. And finally, the fourth possibility for this solid carbon that plants have fixed from the atmosphere is that as the plants and plankton in the ocean do this as well, as they die and decay, they're eaten or partially eaten by bacteria and fungi. And it's this fourth pathway that enables some of that carbon to not be returned to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, but instead to form soil carbon. And moving from chemistry to artistry, I've got a beautiful image here by my collaborator and illustrator, Camille Heisler, which just demonstrates that the majority of the soil carbon is at the surface of the soil. You can see much darker carbon where the soil interacts with the atmosphere and also really the crucially important role of plants in moving carbon down to deeper depths in the soil. So why focus so much on soil carbon? Surely the problem is with the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And I don't debate that for a moment. And I would certainly um, advocate that soil carbon and land management needs to be part of our response to climate change. But there is a lot of carbon stored in soils at the moment. The soil carbon pool is bigger than the combined amount of carbon in the atmosphere and in above ground terrestrial biomass. And there's also a lot of soil on the planet. Everywhere you look around, particularly if you're not right in the middle of the city, as none of us um, have been very much lately, you will see soil underneath your feet. It's underneath the buildings, um, even in the city. But all around us, there are these soil, potential soil pools that could hold more carbon. That biggest pool down at the bottom, you wouldn't want to dive into. That's the fossil fuel pool. This is a different representation of the carbon cycle, which really hones in on and focuses in on the soil-related aspects of the carbon cycle. So as we talked about before, in green, we've got photosynthesis with carbon dioxide moving from the atmosphere into plants. Then we've got animals coming in at the brown number two step, which both those animals and, and humans as animals are eating that, that plant material. And then much of that carbon dioxide is then returned to the atmosphere as respiration. Plants respire, animals respire. We're all respiring right now. But it, it's the processes described underneath point four here where the dead plant and animal material is eaten and partially eaten and transformed by fungi and bacteria, that some of that carbon is able to be stabilised by interacting with mineral particles in the soil or 
by finding itself in a part of the soil where there is not the right conditions for bacteria and fungi to keep decomposing it. So in very wet conditions or very acidic conditions where decomposition can't proceed. And then in geologic time, some of that buried originally photosynthetic plant material is what has formed fossil fuels. So as I said, there are a lot of soils around the globe and 50% of the terrestrial land surface is actually already in use for agriculture and food and human use of that land. And in many places, we've Change the way that we manage the land to actually increase the amount of respiration that's occurring. So there's less photosynthesis and more respiration. So we've altered that natural carbon cycle such that agricultural lands are large emitters of greenhouse gases. And those emissions have almost doubled just since 1965. And they continue to increase under conventional industrial agricultural practices. So while we talk a lot about keeping coal in the ground and keeping fossil fuels in the ground and not opening up new mines, not many people are aware that we've also been mining soil carbon. This is, as we saw in the previous diagram, it's a slowly, very slowly renewable resource, but it initially begins with the photosynthesis of plants and makes its way into the soil. And we've been mining carbon out of the soil inadvertently in the way that we manage the majority of our food producing landscapes. Now, there's increasing recognition of the critical importance of healthy soils for making healthy foods. So as well as providing a physical structure for plants to grow in, which in some schools of thought around plant production is the only role of soil, soils also play other really important roles in growing healthy foods. They provide essential nutrients and also that important balance between water and oxygen. We know that plant roots get their water from soils. They also need to be in an oxygenated environment, most certainly most of our crop plants. And where we are able to support healthy and biodiverse soils, we're able to support a natural resistance to insects and weed pests and plant diseases. As agricultural scientists work more closely with microbial ecologists, we're starting to understand the incredibly important beneficial symbiotic associations between the bacteria and fungi in the soil and plant roots. And there's still a lot more work to be done in that space. Healthy soils help to release nutrients from dead organic matter to make them available to plants. And so that minimises the requirements for adding additional inorganic fertilisers And there's just a small point here, but this is a really important point in Australia about improving soil structure. So healthy soils are able to retain and also then release to plants water in a much more useful way than soils without much organic matter. And in such a dry and variable rainfall continent such as Australia, this aspect of soil structure is a really, really important um, part of the role that healthy soils play in both growing food and increasing the resilience of our agricultural landscapes to climate change. So now I'm going to take you and introduce you to the 4 per meal initiative. The 4 per meal initiative, Soils for Food Security and Climate, aims to increase the soil organic matter content and carbon sequestration through the implementation of agricultural practices which are adapted to local environmental, social and economic conditions as proposed 
in particular by the agroecology, agroforestry, regenerative agriculture, conservation agriculture, and landscape management approaches. Now, four per mil, why is it called, what, what's with this obscure name? Well, this initiative eventuated around, uh, it was launched at the Paris Climate Talks and it was initially supported by the French government. And four per mil is the way that they express 0.4 of a percent. So four per mil or 0.4 of a percent, less than half of a percent, is the aspirational level for carbon sequestration in soils via agriculture and forestry. So in productive lands that we continue to use for food and fibre production. The vision of the four per mil initiative is regenerated and carbon rich soils to fight climate change and hunger all around the planet. These are the three goals of the four per mil initiative to accelerate climate change mitigation actions now, to intensify and speed up the adaptation of agriculture to climate change and to improve food security. These goals are complementary. They're not in contradiction to each other and they can be achieved all at the same time using different approaches, of course, in different parts of the world. How? How are we going to do this? This initiative though I mentioned it evolved in France, has had the input of really prominent and expert and, how shall we say, old and knowledgeable soil scientists from across Europe, the US and Australia have contributed to the 4 per mil initiative. And it's very cognizant of the fact that different practices are required in different parts of the world. So the means is by making agricultural practices evolve, encouraging people to gradually change their agricultural practices towards agroecology, including agroforestry, conservation agriculture, regenerative agriculture and sustainable landscape management. And now I'm going to share with you a little cartoon video explaining the 4 per mil initiative. Soils for food security and climate. Human activities release enormous quantities of carbon dioxide, CO2, into the atmosphere. This intensifies the greenhouse effect and accelerates climate change. Every year, plants recover 30% of CO2 thanks to their process of photosynthesis. Later, when the plants die and decompose, living organisms in the soil such as bacteria, fungi and earthworms transform them into organic matter. This carbon-rich organic matter is essential for human food because it holds water, nitrogen and phosphorus, which are essential to the growth of plants. The world's soil contains two to three times more carbon than the atmosphere. Increasing this storage of carbon by 0.4% per year, or four parts per thousand, in the top 30 or 40 centimetres of the soil could stop the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is the proposal of the four parts per thousand soils for food security and the climate initiative. The increase in carbon storage in soils would therefore contribute not only to stabilising the climate, but also to ensuring food security, that is, the supply of sufficient food for all people. How can it be carried out? Policy measures must be established to reduce deforestation and encourage ecological farming practices that boost the amount of organic matter in soils and meet the four parts per thousand every year objective. Examples would be Avoid leaving the soil bare, so as to limit carbon loss. Restore crops, pastures and degraded forests. Plant trees and legumes that have the ability to fix atmospheric nitrogen in the soil. Use manure and composts to nourish the soil or allow water to collect at the base of plants. 
Who is targeted? There are 570 million farms in the world and more than 3 billion people living in rural areas that could implement these practices. At what cost? To restore agricultural soils, it would cost a few dozen dollars per hectare. However, agroforestry and the renewal of forests would require more investments. And for how long? The sequestration of carbon in soil would continue for 20 to 30 years after the good farming practices are put in place, provided these practices are maintained. Under the Four Parts Per Thousand initiative, researchers are coming together with farmers, associations, economic stakeholders, regions and countries for the purpose of food security and climate. That was fun, wasn't it? But fast. To recap, the six suggested approaches to storing more carbon in the soil are to limit the working of the soil. Now, you might know this already as low-till or no-till or conservation agriculture, where we're not ploughing the soil multiple times per year and leaving it bare. Fertilisers, carefully considered application of inorganic fertilisers complemented by greatly increased use of manures and compost of organic fertilisers so that we can add nutrients and carbon back into the soil at the same time. Intermediate crops. This is the idea that as well as our primary focus commercial production crop, we take every opportunity to grow plants on the soil. So we keep the soil covered by growing intermediate crops, both intermediate in space, in terms of growing um, another species in between the rows. Intercropping is what it was um, known as when I was working on this uh, approach up in the Tibetan agricultural lands, but also intermediate in time. So never leaving the soil bare and growing, say, a green manure crop, some kind of crop that you're not going to actually harvest and sell, but that simply keeps the soil covered and can then be um, returning that carbon back into the soil in between the main crop rotations. Hedges. Hedges and agroforestry. It sounds like such a small and simple and kind of quaint thing to be encouraging the return of hedges to our agricultural landscapes. But in fact, there's been widespread spread removal of trees and shrubs and woody vegetation in areas where industrialised agriculture needs to use really large machinery. And so this removal of these bigger, more woody structures in from our agricultural landscapes has been extremely extensive. And we can store more carbon in soil by returning these woody plants to our agricultural landscapes, as well as really increasing biodiversity. So hedges and trees are really important habitat for birds and insects, which many people really enjoy in agricultural landscapes. So returning hedges and trees to the landscape has both carbon and other biodiversity benefits. It's got some really important shelter benefits too in many parts of the world where stock need these structures to shelter from increasing extremes of both heat and cold in the climate. The fifth suggestion here is around grasslands, and that's quite open-ended, but what the Four Per Mill Initiative is suggesting is that the management of grasslands for grazing can store more carbon in the soil when carefully considered, when the relationship between the consumers, the, the animals that are grazing the plants, and the plants themselves and their recovery time is carefully managed to optimise both the growth of the animal but also the growth of the plant. And in many places this requires changing our grazing regimes to 
more short, intense periods of grazing and then moving animals to a different part of the landscape. And then finally, the sixth recommendation here is around landscape restoration or land restoration. Agriculture has expanded into many marginal areas that are not optimum for growing food and fibre. And these marginal areas are then tend to be not very productive. And so continuing land degradation can occur in these areas that were unsuitable for agricultural production in the first place. And so restoration of these degraded landscapes has the potential to store lots of carbon and particularly in wetland soils, which is much of the focus of the work of my group at RMIT. Now, it's this landscape restoration aspect that I'm going to share with you for the next little while. And I want to particularly introduce you to Pete. If we were together, you could shake hands with Pete. This is a handful of extremely carbon-rich soil. Peat soils or organosols occur around the world, but particularly in places where the conditions, the environmental conditions, mean that plants grow faster than microbes are able to decompose them. So that balance in the carbon cycle is altered in favour of the build-up of organic material. And first, we're going to visit the Australian alpine peatlands. Now, I first met peat when I was coming to the end of my two degrees, my chemistry degree and my political science degree. And I really enjoyed both of those things, but I knew that I didn't want to work all of the time in a laboratory in a dark room with big, big instruments or in an office. And that was when I discovered soil science and particularly the Australian alpine peatlands. And I've got to say, I had a glorious honours and PhD study site. The Australian Alps is a beautiful part of Australia and I was lucky enough to be able to work on the Wellington Plains peatland for many years and got to know peat really well. So I'm going to give you a super rapid introduction to try and compress all that I've learned in the last couple of decades about peatlands into this slide so we can then move on and have a look um, underground at some of the um, at some of the processes that are going on in peatlands in Australia and elsewhere. Peatlands need water. They need to be wet. They are a type of wetland. They're a subset of wetland where peat soil builds up. And to enable that balance between the carbon being fixed through photosynthesis and the carbon then being respired and returned to the atmosphere by microbial respiration, water hinders that breakdown of plant material. So peatlands need to stay wet to exist. And they also need not to have a lot of tracks or drains or roads or physical disturbance through them. But in return, peatlands provide. They provide, as well as beautiful places um, to do research, they also provide water. It might seem counterintuitive. I'm saying on the one hand, they need water. And on the other hand, they provide water. But it's true. This part of Australia is really important hydrologically to this, our dry country for a number of reasons. You might be aware of our hydroelectricity generation, Snowy Hydro, and in Victoria, we also have a smaller hydroelectricity generated from Rocky Valley Dam operated by AGL. That placement of hydroelectricity in the Alps was very considered and strategic. These are high rainfall and low evapotranspiration parts of our country. And so they're the ideal place to be capturing and storing large amounts of water to generate hydroelectricity. And of course, the Alps are also the top of the catchment, the head of the catchments that feed into the Murray-Darling 
irrigation system. So much of Australia's agricultural food bowl is in that Murray-Darling irrigation area and the Alps provide the majority of the water, particularly in dry years, into those rivers that we draw our irrigation water from. So peatlands are an efficient ecosystem in terms of transferring water from rainfall into stream flow within and already efficient catchment in terms of transferring rainfall into stream flow within the country. So as well as that important hydrologic role, peatlands also provide soil carbon sequestration. They provide a safe, long-term storage for carbon. The tiny little sphagnum mosses and the other shrubs and plants that grow in the peatlands are just, you know, growing slowly each year, but they've been doing so and storing that carbon in the soil in the build-up of peat for thousands of years. We've done some carbon-14 dating of these peatlands and six, 8,000 years is not, is not uncommon. And finally, the other important thing that peatlands provide is habitat for biodiversity from international migratory birds that stop in these wet oases in a dry landscape to the tiny and very rarely seen endangered corroboree frogs and bore frogs. The peatlands in the Australian Alps are a really important habitat for biodiversity. And the next couple of slides is gives you a, a snapshot, an insight, into some of the processes that are happening underground in these high carbon soils. You can see in the photographs the two kinds of peat soils that I was particularly focusing my early studies on. One is the intact sphagnum peatland. It's, um, that's the much deeper profile and you can actually see the water at the bottom of that picture. And then the smaller picture is what we refer to as dried or degraded peatlands. It's only perhaps 20 centimetres deep. And just with our eyes, with light, we're able to see there's a big difference between the soil properties, but between the soils in these two parts of a peatland. And I was able to take another form of using light to, to um, explore these ecosystems and that is the squiggly lines on the other side of the picture. So this is some spectra from carbon-13 nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy that I did with my collaborators and my, my supervisors, Jeff Bordock's lab over at CSIRO in Adelaide. And there we were able to use spectroscopy, this other way of looking at what's going on in the soil underground. We looked at how the chemical bonds are formed and which atoms are attached to other atoms. And we use that to quantify the extent of decomposition of that organic carbon that forms the peat soils. And what was perhaps the most exciting part for me of this work was how the carbon chemistry and the hydrology of these systems came together in an analytical manner. Now, I'm not going to go through the finer details of what is going on here, but suffice to say that we were able to find a strong relationship between the chemistry that we measured using the carbon-13 nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and then we've done some modelling to estimate the different molecular components that comprise the peat. You can see some labels of carbohydrates, proteins, lignans, lipids, carbonyl and others. And so we found a really strong relationship of, with an R squared of 0.97, which makes a scientist very happy, um, between this innocuous little letter K. I've put a red square around K because there's so much going on on this slide that its significance could easily be overlooked. But K here is hydraulic conductivity. Hydraulic conductivity, when it's at home, is water movement. So as well as the chemistry, I also did lots of soil physics measurements to quantify how the water moved through the peat. This is a um, very time-consuming and, uh, what's the word, fiddly measurement to do that 
is very difficult to do in the field. So we need to carefully take samples back to the lab. But when you're thinking of a wetland, how water moves through, it's pretty important, right? And if you're thinking about restoring a degraded landscape that depends on water, some numbers around the water movement and the amount of water held by these soils is going to be pretty important for planning how to restore these landscapes so that they can hold more carbon. And we found that the chemistry was able to predict the hydrology very strongly. In the decade or so, decade and a half since I did my PhD on the Australian alpine peats, I've had the good fortune to continue to visit and study these fascinating ecosystems. And I think I've indoctrinated my family into that passion. You can see here, my son Murray is taking a very close look at what is going on in an alpine peatland. And Murray was able to help us put up the first flux tower over a peatland system, in fact, uh, in, in the Australian Alps just a couple of summers ago. So while I had been busy working in other parts of Australia and around the world on other soil carbon and greenhouse gas questions, the Australian government had been thinking and considering and recognising the importance of peatlands. And you can see the document the more formal document on this slide is the National Recovery Plan for Alpine Sphagnum Bogs and Associated Fens. And that's a federal government document that came out in 2015, laying out a plan to restore these ecosystems in all of the states and territories in Australia where they occur. So collaborating with Parks Victoria and La Trobe University Professor Ewan Sylvester, you can see here in the black top, and some really experienced meteorological scientists from CSIRO who were able to put this flux tower. And, and from a, with a little bit of help from Murray, who carried some tools and asked some good questions, we are able to put this flux tower up, which is a really useful way of looking at what's going on in that soil plant atmosphere continuum. So we had been really looking in detail at what was going on underground and taking some chamber measurements above the surface of the greenhouse gases. But this flux tower enables us to really, in great detail, 10 times every second, the flux tower is taking measurements right now from when we set it up in 2017. We've had really um, smooth sailing in terms of how this system is able to perform in a really challenging environment. So we're feeling very well supported by our colleagues at CSIRO and La Trobe, but also very fortunate that we've been able to gather this incredible data, which really is a record of these special ecosystems breathing. We're measuring the carbon dioxide fluxes 10 times every second, which we process and collate the data into half hour. Fluxes. So we've got half hour data here for every half hour over a two year period from when we first put the tower in. And what we found is that Australian alpine peatlands, this one in particular that we're studying, it's still forming peat. And in fact, it's a strong sink for carbon. Now, this is the very detailed and careful work of my PhD student, Delani Gunnawood Hunter. And she has gone further than just the carbon dioxide fluxes. She has also quantified the methane fluxes from these systems, as well as the carbon which enters and leaves the peatland in dissolved form. So that's the DOC, dissolved organic carbon, and dissolved inorganic carbon, DIC, work that she's done in collaboration with her co-supervisor, Professor Ewan Sylvester. And Delaney has found that when all of these different inflows and outflows of carbon are taken into account. And also we're taking into account the winter dormancy and the growing season growing, that this healthy peatland sequesters 292 grams of carbon every metre squared every year. Now that is an ecosystem worth conserving and in areas where that capacity is not occurring because 
we've um, many of the areas in our Australian Alps have suffered from cattle grazing and fire, and now they've got the added pressure of climate change. This is an ecosystem worth restoring because it's doing some really important work for us. We're now going to look at a more local example of carbon farming, where the Warren Bean Farm Collective in central Victoria is transitioning their family farm from a traditional merino sheep enterprise to a modern day carbon farm. Serenity Hill grew up on this property in central Victoria and she is now changing the way that this land is farmed, but within the agricultural and social community and landscapes that we are familiar with. So the Warren Bain Farm Collective is still farming sheep on this property, but in a different way. Regenerative agriculture allows them to just switch the focus a little from a purely animal production focus to taking a whole systems, a whole landscape and social ecological systems approach and both grow sheep to eat as well as storing more carbon in the soil. It's subtle changes in the number of stocks, stock that are kept on the land on the way stock are managed and moved around the property. But after just 18 months, they're already starting to see the results. And we're working together with the Warren Bain Farm Collective to look at the changes in carbon in their soils. And we're also some of their biggest fans in terms of enjoying their carbon farmed lamb. And that is um, my son again, giving the thumbs up to the Warren Bain Farm Collective's delicious lamb burgers. Regenerative agriculture has been going along quietly, making changes in the landscape in Australia for quite some time. The Four Per Mill initiative aims to really accelerate and um, spread and share those small individual stories so that we can see more landscape level changes and this is a really important change that we need to come together to make if we want to combat climate change in all of the different ways that we possibly can. Australia is a big emitter of greenhouse gases. This is the per country graph and we don't show up but on the per capita graph we are right up there. But you might be surprised to learn that food loss and food waste, if it were a country, would actually be in third place as the third biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. Now, that's not just one aspect of the food system. It's all the different aspects of food that we waste, both domestically and in production, and the whole food system. But we all have the opportunity to change this because we might not all have a family farm on which we can um, refocus on farming the whole ecosystem and farming carbon, but we all eat. And as many of you might also have a compost bin at home, I have a compost bin in my backyard, which tends to be a big pile of semi-decomposed vegetable matter that gets very little attention. But that is starting to change as I have begun on a research endeavour looking at how to make better compost faster with Partners Maze Distribution and Melbourne Food Hub. You can see here not just my own messy, unattended compost bin in my garden, but in the other picture, we've got a replicated scientific experiment where we've got 30 compost bins that we're actually measuring all of the parameters that help our food waste to decompose from just what you cut up in the kitchen to a rich and valuable soil carbon building ameliorant known as compost, which we can all make. We're looking at how to do this best and how to support consumers with the knowledge that they need to make composting easy. Now, some of you might say composting is very easy and this is, you know, just like uh, general knowledge. 
But many people I've spoken to have given composting a go. They want to give it a try, but they run into problems and they don't know how to solve those problems. And so they give it up and they're putting their food waste back in the general rubbish bin. Now, this research is aiming to develop both the science, but also the knowledge resources to support people to take that food waste, that greenhouse gas source, and turn it into a rich source of carbon to build carbon in our soils. And in fact, these compost bins, these 30 full-size compost bins are going to be delivering their compost up to the Warren Bain farm later this year. So we can start to close that urban rural food cycle on an experimental scale. And finally, I want to share with you a vision that I would love to see realised. This is a soil carbon climate certified logo. You're not going to find this on any supermarket shelf just yet because my son and I, with the help of some graphic designers, actually designed it and it's not yet in use. But I often am happy to support farmers who I think are doing a good job looking after the soil by choosing something with a logo that says organic. I'm really interested in supporting supply chains that are paying farmers a decent wage and recompense for their product. So I often choose food which has a logo which says fair trade on it. We have a great system in Australia where we can quickly and easily recognise how healthy the food in a pa- in packaged food is with our system of stars. And I would love to see alongside those logos a soil carbon certified logo so that we could all support the producers of food who are thinking about the whole carbon cycle and their role in the carbon cycle and are actively managing their land to add more carbon into their soils as well as producing food. So farmers who are really implementing the goals of the four per meal initiative could gain an accreditation as a soil carbon climate certified producer. And those of us who want to support that kind of climate action could then make that choice, could actively make that choice, not just by Uh, engaging with the alternative food system and buying their produce directly from Open Food Network, but actually in the supermarket every day. Now, I want to um, reiterate that this is my vision. This is not currently a reality, and none of these products on this slide have soil carbon certified production. They have their other, the other organic and food health ticks of approval, but this is not an endorsement of sanitarium or or Paul's and their carbon farming practices, although I hope that it will be in the future. And I'm going to leave you tonight with the sustainable development goals. These have been around for a few years, so some of you may have come across them in different contexts, and for others of you, they might be more Um, of a new but attractive way of thinking about where we want our future to go. The Sustainable Development Goals have been developed by the UN and taken on at all different levels of society. Melbourne Water uses the Sustainable Development Goals. The Victorian Government is developing their environmental reporting around the Sustainable Development Goals and even my own University RMIT is looking to implement the Sustainable Development Goals throughout all of their different, like not just research, but all of their different activities. So I've put a green circle around number two, zero hunger, number six, clean water and sanitation, number 13, climate action. I'm sure after tonight you're very clear on how soils relate to climate action. And also number 15, life on land. These four goals clearly are linked with soils and soil science. And if we overlay the food system on top of those circles with these red circles, you'll see that between food and soils, we have the majority of the sustainable development goals covered. So when you're thinking about climate action, I hope that you will not ignore the possibilities right below your feet 
and that you'll support farmers who are doing so and advocate to our governments to support both legislation and practical action around storing more carbon in the soils and enabling consumers to make those supportive choices as well through a soil carbon certification scheme. And if you want to learn more about any of these things, it would be fantastic to hear from you. Thanks.